This is a production of WEDU PBS, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota. Support for this program was generously provided by New York Life Foundation, the National Cremation Society, BayCare Behavior Health Services, Empath Health, the Tidewell Foundation, Heartwood Preserve, and the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay. Through this pandemic, we are all experiencing loss. Around the world today, people are united in their sadness as family members and friends die of coronavirus. Already on the first day of in-person learning, there are six reported cases. This ritual of grief uh, in the Black community is, is a burden in and of itself. And on the other hand, Florida also has a unique economy that exposes our state to a much greater hit. Death is a guarantee. We simply cannot avoid the toll it takes on us. It's the unwanted human experience that inevitably separates us from our loved ones, our family, icons, and neighbors. In death's aftermath, grief can be confusing and overwhelming, and the challenges of the global pandemic, political, and racial tensions have exacerbated that pain. Over the past year, we found ourselves navigating a new world defined by fear, sacrifice, accommodation, and plenty of instability. We've had to make some of the most difficult decisions of our lives in the face of uncertainty. So how do we begin to meaningfully untangle all that devastation to really look at it and address it? In this first installment of WEDU's Public Square, we'll explore grief and loss in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll hear from the voices of our community sharing their losses, and we'll connect you with experts and leaders to offer you thought-provoking insight and tangible advice to cope. So how do we start this reluctant journey? Grief, where it often begins, at death's door. My mother was Garlin Boyd. She was a, a track coach, a mother, a legend. She was St. Pete through and through. She loved her community and her community loved her back. She was a big, lovable teddy bear to me. She, <laughs> my life was her life. She literally was there for everything. And whenever you saw her, you saw me. She was a state champion in I think 84, 83. And so her competitive fire and didn't really die out when she stopped doing track and field. It was all about making a Michael Jordan to her. Anybody can coach a Michael Jordan, but if you can make a Michael Jordan, that was her goal. That's what she desired. That's what she wanted in life. And Marion is loose. 40, 30. Can they catch it? And that is a new world junior record. So we had that, that drill sergeant on the field. But when those lights shut off at the end of the night and those track gates close and that home door opens, when I tell you, it was a total different person. They're laughing, we're joking, and her door was always open. She just became that big brother, big sister figure. You having trouble in school, she's going to check on you. Kids who were getting you know, arrested, she's up there bailing them out, doing whatever she had to do. Hey, if I get you out, you're gonna come around for me. You're gonna get shaped up. And a lot of them held up to that promise. She actually told me in a joking manner that she had COVID. She calls me one day. She was like, guess what I got? I'm like, what do you mean, what do you have? Like, what, you got some food or something? Like, I think you got a slice of pizza or something. Nah, mom, baby, I got COVID. And she just starts laughing. I'm like, it's not a laughing matter. What's wrong with you? She was like, oh, it's all right. I beat everything else. I beat this too. 
I called Ashton, hey, how you doing? Y'all all right? I'm coming down tomorrow. Got to see y'all. He's like, uh, yeah, mom's in the hospital. So I'm like, what you talking about? She got COVID. I'll be down tomorrow. Came down, me and him talk. Hey, I'm back home. Whatever y'all need, let's get it together. Let's make sure she gets back home. Maybe not an hour later, he got the phone call. It was an absolute shock. I didn't think it would take her as fast as it did. Honestly, to this day, it's still unreal. I believe I've been trying to bury it. Losing somebody like that so suddenly, when it's just, it's not in the plans, you're not preparing for this, it doesn't, it doesn't register at the magnitude that it needs to. A lot of people have had rough lives. My mother was a bright light in it. People lost a public figure. People lost a legend in the community. So dealing with the funeral and the service and everything, it was, it was a bit much. Yeah, it was a lot. I hurt mostly for him. He was her life. I miss her laugh, and I miss... <clears throat> and I miss her hugs. I miss uh, her literally just asking me to sit with her and just fall asleep on her chest sometimes. I hear my mother sometimes tell me in my head that it's okay to cry, it's okay to sit by yourself and reflect and just breathe and just get through this. What helped is me and Ashton's laughter from bringing up certain memories. Her legacy is now my legacy. Now, I don't know if I, can, if I can help and touch as many kids as she did, but I'm gonna try and I'm gonna make sure that the role that I have now in the community, as much as it is a positive one, is a constant one, is a consistent one. On behalf of our entire team at WEDU, our condolences go out to all the families that have lost someone during these times of COVID-19. It has certainly changed everything about what we've come to expect about death and dying. We are privileged to have some very special guests joining us on this panel, this panel, this first of several. Um, we want to welcome Dr. Lisa Merritt, who is the founder and executive director of the Multicultural Health Institute. We also want to welcome Kathy Quantz, who is the senior community counselor at Empath Health. Dr. Merritt, I'll pose the first question to you. In all of your years as a medical doctor, how has COVID-19 changed death. It's changed the way hospital systems work because we've had to severely restrict to keep our staff and the active patients safe. So we've had to restrict family visitations and interactions and the usual support that's part of just any healing process, much less a death and dying process. So the patient remains isolated, the family remains isolated. We've been able to take advantage of these new technologies like Zoom and FaceTime and iPads but it's certainly not the same as someone holding someone's hand. The ritual around death and dying has changed, and this affects many cultural and ethnic groups. Many people aren't accustomed to cremation, which is often happening now. And the whole idea of having a funeral on a personal basis, I've, I've had several people that we've had either virtual funerals or I've gone to a funeral, and it's an entirely different setup because you have to have distancing, you have to have a limited right. number of people. It's so the whole process has changed. There's going to be a lot of unresolved grief issues as people have had to repress and just keep going through with their life, their family's life as they're losing people. How would, and this question is for both of you, how would you say that COVID has made it harder to move through the stages? 
or maybe it hasn't. You all are the experts. Has COVID made it harder to move through the stages of grieving? Absolutely. It's definitely complicated things. Um, it's a lot of people almost have a sense of disenfranchised grief of, you know, that it they they don't know that they deserve to have grief or um, or you get someone that they tell they tell someone oh my dad you know passed away last week and they're like oh did he die of COVID and you say no he had a heart attack oh okay and you feel like well it wasn't COVID so it's not as bad of a deal well yes it is it's a horrible thing for that person experiencing that loss and COVID in and of itself, just all of us trying to, to cope with it and get our head around it, I think, um, you know, it causes its own form of depression and anger and anxiety, isolation and loneliness. And those are also all feelings of grief. And so sometimes I think people aren't sure, is it the chicken or the egg? What, what am I experiencing? And they're probably experiencing both, both. for sure. But it just it, it's just making it a lot more complicated. Well, I think one of the challenges is that it's upended people's lives in general. And so many people do not have the emotional currency or, or, or opportunity to really allow themselves that. They're so busy trying to contend with surviving. People are starving. People are out of work. People are about to be evicted. I mean, you're dealing with so many major life crises at the same time. They have to sort of shut down emotionally and not really process all of that. I know that people of color in general are kind of more accustomed to all of these kind of continual crises and having a lot of people that they're connected to be sick and unfortunately have a disproportionate number of people die and usually have strong faith-based backgrounds and they sort of just handle what they can handle and they leave the rest to a higher power. How can we um, be empathetic, sympathize, but still help ourselves or help a loved one move forward? Um, well, I think it's important that we feel the feelings. You know, we need to let ourselves go through the process and you can't rush it, you can't go over it, you can't go under it, you can't go around it, you have to go through it and hopefully come to a point in time over a process that we can focus on that love and that relationship and not focus on the death itself. Um, when you look at grieving and helping each other in the grieving process, um, what can we do to, to, to be better at that? Listen, everybody wants to say something. Everybody wants to give an opinion. Everybody's an instant expert. The most important thing I do when I walk into the patient's room is listen to them. I may ask them a few questions, but then I must listen because 90% of the diagnosis is going to be in what they tell me if I just listen carefully. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're a society that I mean, it's too much output, you know, one way communications with texting, emails, Instagrams, there's not enough exchange. The art of communication and conversation is being lost. It's, time, it's an opportunity to revisit that and hear one another and affirm and validate one another's feelings. I think exercising and being in nature, taking yourself away from this and really physically, literally being outside, we need more of just be outside, take a walk if you can, hear the birds. I had one of my nine-year-old patients today just tell me how much she enjoys the morning because I round early. And hearing the birds, watching the sunrise, it helps us remember the timelessness of life and that everything has a cycle and everything has a season and this too will pass. And sometimes it is important to acknowledge that maybe we need some extra help from professionals, from experts like yourselves who are um, trained in trauma and are trauma-informed and can help us move through those stages of grief in a healthy way. What would be a local resource, a support group perhaps, that you would recommend? Well, I would recommend Empath Health, um, Life Path. I would recommend Tidewell, all the different local hospices um, to call them first. Um, and even if they don't have a community program like we do to provide um, bereavement counseling for those that lost someone not under hospice care, um, they will guide the person on how to find somebody. And another great resource is psychologytoday.com. Um, it's a great search engine to find um, a mental health professional in your area. 
And then another thing is if, if a person is working and has this, um, the benefit available of EAP, of Employee Assistance Program, that's a wonderful resource to use. Um, the Multicultural Health Institute has worked with a community collaborative creating the Multicultural Action Team. And we have a community resilience dashboard that can be reached through our website. On that dashboard, not only do we have mental health resources, like how to reach Centristone, Tidewell, and other providers, um, national hotlines, crisis hotlines, but also local resources. Many mental health challenges come from anxiety around not knowing how to cope and get help that people need. Well, we wanna thank you both for joining us. Um, speaking grief is not an easy thing, and you're really helping our community to deal with this difficult time of, of death in times of COVID. We wanna thank you so much. Pleasure, thank you for the opportunity. You're very welcome. We continue now on this journey, realizing that grief can be full yet formless, constantly changing under the stress and struggles of our lives. As we learn how to cope for ourselves, it can be easy to overlook our responsibility to protect and prepare the next generation. Adolescents by nature are already going through their own discomforts of growth and change. So what happens when you layer on top of that the losses of a worldwide pandemic? So this right here is my dad's ashes. Usually I would bring it almost everywhere. This really makes me feel more comfortable because then I know that he's actually like right there next to me. So it's kind of like he's always there, like he used to be. It was July 29th, four years ago. I got the phone call two days after because they didn't find him right away. And she was devastated. I just started crying and that night wasn't very good and then my grieving started happening and then I wasn't really myself. I slept in my room and I wouldn't get out. We had a million breakdowns and I would cry and she would cry and she'd get mad at me and she'd scream at God and I just said we have to just talk to him and think about him every day and I will share memories throughout your life. I have shirts for, from his, I have socks, um, I have shoes that I sometimes wear too. Um, and we haven't washed any of the clothes um, because smell is definitely something that really makes you feel like it's still there. It's really kind of weird to see adults think that I'm happy whenever I'm sad or lonely or angry, but I just don't show it. Sometimes we could be happy on the outside, but be so devastated on the inside. I actually told my mom, I think it was in third grade, that I felt lonely. It's something that us kids don't understand how to go through and really know how to find someone who's like us, finding a group for other people, for kids and even adults can really help them with their loneliness or even sadness or anger because it can really help you cope with it. I remember my first group, my, my hands were shaking, I was so nervous. And once I got there and once we started talking about it and we said our names and we said who died and we had litter candles that remembered them and kept them in the middle of the table. The kids made me feel definitely at home. It felt like my own little family. So when COVID hit and we're still in school and all the craziness that was going on and it was, we shut down here and here and here and then finally the school closed here. Yes, I don't have to do schoolwork. And then next, a like couple weeks after they said, I have to do my learning. It was fun, but also kind of sad because we were supposed to have a fifth grade walkout, which is where you go through all the campus with people lining up and like hooraying and you get to see your old teachers and you get to high fives and you can't do that. Kids need that socialization, whether it's from 
you know, being able to just be whoever they need to be away from their parents, being able to talk to your friends and get support from them. Um, that was challenging. You try so hard with the phones. It's not the same as a face-to-face. It's definitely about the loneliness because I know a lot of kids who feel lonely. I knew I couldn't go to my friends who really understand me whenever I needed them. I had to go onto like a certain app to talk to them. And the teachers who actually knew what I was going through didn't, I couldn't talk to them one-on-one and I couldn't see their faces and tell them how I'm feeling because you can't do that whenever you're doing e-learning. Knowing that I wasn't able to go to school for the entire year was very devastating to me because first of all, my grieving was still kind of happening. Grief never goes away. Not for Haley, not for me. We'd go one day at a time and sometimes it's a minute at a time. Sometimes it's an hour. It sucked. School stopped, but we, we've been through worse, Haley and I. Now this is just a, another thing we gotta get through. It's something that you can't do alone. It's just one of those things where you go on your own and you're like, I can't do this. And you turn back around and then you grab someone else and you go. And it's way better because you can face these challenges together. I think of it as a video game. You have two people, your friend and yourself. You go through a dungeon or something with a bunch of monsters. You'll be to other fight them. And then once you're done, it's like a big woo kind of moment. Our panel discussion now continues on the topic of adolescence and grief and how best to help not just the children and the teenagers that are involved in this, but also caregivers and parents to navigate through this process. Joining us, we have Danielle Vassone, who is a licensed clinical social worker at Tidewell Hospice and the director of the Blue Butterfly Family Grief Center. We're also joined by Dr. Julie Kaplow, who is the executive director of the Trauma and Grief Center at the Hackett Center for Mental Health in Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Julie, my question to you is, what does adolescent grief look like? Sure, so what we know about adolescent grief is that there's no right or wrong way to grieve and that children and adolescents of different ages grieve in very different ways. But what we do know is that there are sort of three common dimensions of grief that we often see in children and adolescents. And the first is what we call separation distress, and that's really yearning or longing for the person who died and really missing them. The second bereavement-related challenge that adolescents often face is this idea of existential or identity distress. Who am I without this person? Or how am I going to be able to live my life without this person physically here? And the third dimension is circumstance-related distress, being very preoccupied or worried about how the person died. And that includes shame or guilt over the death. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more of this now in the context of COVID because kids know that they could potentially spread COVID-19. And that's been a real fear and concern of a lot of the adolescents that we've seen. The good news though, is that for each of those different bereavement related challenges, we see the adaptive side of grieving. And so with separation distress, we see adolescents finding ways of staying connected to the person who died in healthy ways. With existential distress, we see kids living the life that they know that would make the person proud of them or living the legacy of the person. And with circumstance related distress, we see kids all the time gravitating toward trying to change the circumstances of the death into something meaningful that could actually help other people. So empowering adolescents to think about how they're helping to not spread COVID-19 or Mm -hmm. rallying to ensure that more kids in school wear masks or things like that. The two of you have seen children who are having a a very difficult time with this because they had pre-existing grief that they were trying to work through. How has COVID-19 made that process even harder for these children. Um, We're seeing here at Blue Butterfly kids who are so afraid of their parent dying. Um, They already had one parent die and now they're afraid of their other parent dying from COVID. Uh, And it's a real fear. And so they actually are telling us, you know, they don't want to come to uh, out of their home or they're not going to go to school in person because they want to protect their parent. 
And so it's, a, it's creating so much more trauma, more fear, worry, and guilt for these kids than they had even before. Um, so we're really seeing long lasting impacts here um, that kids are, are taking on because of COVID-19. What are some specific signs that we should look out for to make sure that we check in on our adolescent and know whether they are okay? Well, we know uh, for our kids, we are always just trying to keep an eye on their sleep and their eating. Are we seeing changes in those? How about their emotional, their emotional outbursts? Are they getting angrier um, at little things before they, where they wouldn't? Um, are they crying more often? Are they having trouble in school? Are you seeing changes in their grades, uh, change in their friends? All of those things really affect them. Uh, we can see that they're being affected by outside traumas by those those things. Is there a way to start the conversation that will increase your chances of, of getting some interaction um, for the child not to just tune out and say, I'm fine? Um, what would be the advice that you would give a parent or a caregiver so that they can say something that opens the door to that conversation? I would say that the most important thing that parents can do is like you said, open the door. So instead of oftentimes with parents, we see them erring on the side of providing too much information and too much feedback or not talking about it at all, thinking let sleeping dogs lie, I don't wanna bring it up or that might plant a seed of distress. So what we tell parents is to simply address it by saying, I know it's so sad not having dad here or I know it's so upsetting to not have mom eating dinner with us. I know it makes me feel sad. I'm wondering how you're feeling. And really allowing the child or adolescent to guide the conversation. And so really being present, being open to those questions and conversations, letting them know that it's not a one and done, that these kinds of conversations can and will happen very frequently, and that the parent or caregiver is there to listen and provide support whenever they need them. What do you say to viewers who have no children, who may not understand that how children are affected in their grieving journey can affect them long-term and ultimately affect the fabric of our communities? So what we know is that most bereaved children are resilient and will go on to lead very healthy, happy lives after the death of a loved one. But we also know that there are many, many children who really suffer after the death of a loved one. And if that suffering is not addressed early on, we know that it can have very important long-term ramifications, including future depression, suicidal ideation, problems in relationships, even alcohol use, substance use. And so what we do now in the more immediate aftermath of a child's loss is critically important to how they'll function over the longer term. And in fact, what we also know is that some of our society's biggest problems today stem from unresolved childhood trauma and loss. And so if we can address it as a community early on, we can likely prevent a lot of future community-based issues that we're dealing with today. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. It's going to help so many families that are dealing with this. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Some of us have escaped the COVID-19 pandemic without the death of a loved one, but none of us have escaped secondary losses to grieve. These can seem small and unimportant compared to the loss of human life, but the truth is they matter a great deal too. Losses of employment, stability, connection, education, even leisure can lead to an identity crisis that changes the course of our lives. I always believe coffee changes your day. A good cup of coffee gets you through the day. A bad cup of coffee, just go back to bed and start over. When people ask me about, you know, is it food, is it wine, is it a cocktail? It's all of it. It's, it's how it all comes together. I get to make very close interpersonal connections with people. I get to brighten somebody's day. Well, the craziest thing is I moved from New York in January. I literally started launched a menu, and then 
we shut down. <laughs> I think I toasted like, hey, we're ready for the season. We're ready for summer. And then the next day it was gone. I didn't know if I was an essential business, what the protocol was going to be. We're just in here one day and Richard was like, oh, you know, I'm kind of worried. Um, I feel like this is gonna be a big deal. And then like two days later, he's like, we gotta close. We closed before the mandate came down for us to close. We closed about two weeks before, um, thinking that I could get my staff jobs. It's a small business, your employees become your family. So you're responsible for their well-being. Make sure that they have sustainability. Make sure that they know their check will be there. When we came back in May, a lot of businesses were closed already. Large companies like Geico or Publix, they were, everybody was working from home. A couple of daycares closed. People are getting stressed out with money. Are they going to have the disposable income to buy a cup of coffee? It's not something where you just dive into another industry, another career. I had the whole thing going where, you know, you make good money, you love what you do, you have a decent work-life balance. It was a couple weeks away from unlocking 401k options. You don't want to give that up when you're sitting in that position. So I didn't go out and search for work because I held on to a desperate hope that my job would take me back. Not working was, was horrible. I went six months. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. That's the, the worst off mentally I've been in my life. I realized a lot of like self-worth, a lot of uh, joy was derivative of, of my workplace. Taking that away, you know, it puts you in this sort of like, or put me in this sort of like dark negative space. Uh, so I, I say that I struggled and I sort of like downplay that, but it was, it was bad. It was really bad. I had a period of time here where I never heard of what night sweats were until I had them. I didn't know what it was like to not sleep for three, four days or only sleep periodically. Understanding and feeling success in COVID, that's what's taken away from me. Like, it doesn't matter how good it was today, I have no idea what tomorrow's gonna be like. Still now, we don't have a full staff. There are some people who were terrified to leave their house. Other people who were just now settling into their financial assistance and then scared that we're gonna reshut down so they didn't wanna stop it and then go to work for a week and you know, who knows what happens. You adapt, you adjust, you don't make three months plan, you make weekly plan. I think what kept me at night was how our community and my customers would react to this. Are we all going to be in a good place? It's a long time to be waiting, I understand. Uh, a lot of people said a lot of things about individuals taking in unemployment, but like, that's the worst six months of my life. <laughs> that was a wake up call. You don't want to put so much like weight, I think, into work that it becomes unhealthy. Love of the water, being out on the water is what really helped me. I don't want to be cheesy, but honestly, it saved my life. When I lay down in bed, I try to push all those thoughts of, well, this is going to go wrong. This is going to bad. Did it, it. I got to push that all away and go, okay, all of these were good things. To deal with that uncertainty of what tomorrow brings puts a higher uh, level of need for me to be around people. You cannot replace a hug and a handshake. We want to make sure our community stays strong throughout this thing. COVID has certainly presented us with many forms of loss, not just the death of a loved one or a friend. And so to talk about this very important aspect of loss, we have assembled a wonderful panel. We wanna first thank you for taking time out of your bus very busy schedules to join us. We have Clara Reynolds, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer for the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay. We have Gabriela Guerrier. She's the Director of Development of the Pinellas County Chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, we also have Rebecca Bass, 
who is the BayCare Bereavement Coordinator. And then we have Dr. Rafael Fuentes, who is a counselor, faculty, and adjunct professor at Hillsborough Community College. Thank you again for joining us on this very important panel. Um, my first question is, why is it so crucial not to overlook secondary loss? I think it's so important to give voice to the changes that have impacted our lives during this time. You know, grief is a natural human response to change that elicits many emotions and grief can surround change of many kinds. It's really important to not minimize our experience and to say, to know that what you're uniquely experiencing is important and valid. That way by saying what it is we're experiencing, giving voice to that, we're able to find new ways to navigate this time. I love the way you phrase that. It's important for us to find healthy ways to navigate this time. And that's a great um, question for Gabriela. Your organization, NAMI, works with families who've experienced different levels of loss. Um, is there a right way or a wrong way to cope with, with secondary loss? I wouldn't necessarily state it as a right or wrong way. There are healthier ways than others to cope with any type of loss. Um, many times we're both peers and the loved ones who care for them, you know, cope this new normal in healthier ways, such as walking, exercising, drinking water, eating healthy, um, still staying connected uh, with individuals, even though we're, you know, physically distanced, we're still socially connected. Um, and then there are some possibly unhealthier ways of coping that we've seen, you know, a bit more use of substance abuse, um, deflecting from dealing with the loss of what's going on. For instance, being on social media, that's a big tool that a lot of times takes away from, you know, a healthier way of coping. So it really, it depends on the person, but there are healthier ways um, and some ways that, you know, tend to do a little bit more damage down the road. And, and how important is it to really take a step back and understand that secondary loss can lead to some very serious consequences. Certainly for every individual, it looks very different, but from what we've experienced here at the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay, we've certainly seen an increase in the number of calls from individuals who are experiencing significant anxiety, uh, despair, depression, related to these secondary losses. Things like you know, losing jobs, uh, losing the ability to connect with elderly family members, um, losing the ability just to have your home be your sanctuary. You know, home is now a space where you're doing everything. And so many callers are calling us, even though they're physically maybe connected with family members, they're feeling very isolated and alone. And all of those feelings are contributing to this sense of mental um, unbalance, this sense of, um, of fragility, um, and even thoughts of suicide. You know, our self-identity is oftentimes associated with our profession or our education, where we've gone to school, uh, the things that we're doing, um, those kinds of things. And so when we lose that sense of self, it has such an incredible impact and a ripple effect uh, across ourselves and across our family. Someone who is elder, at times, just having that one-on-one -on -one visitation and having that kind of family time, cafecito or coffee time, that's what really lifts them up and make them feel like, wow, I had a productive week or I have a productive day. And by losing that, because they have been extremely isolated because you know they are in high risk, it's very, it's very heartbreaking, especially for the family members that they feel, you know, they cannot, they, they have no way to fix this situation because technically we have to kind of obey with the CDC guidelines and, and health recommendations. It's very delicate, but we have to definitely validate those feelings. Otherwise, it might be impactful in the long term. I think about the holidays approaching and the expectations that might be in place and how they might differ from individual to individual and even levels of comfort for gatherings. So we're offering some programming specifically around that. I think there are so many choice points for people to make. And Really, I think the more we can allow each person the, the leeway they need to be able to um, negotiate this time, I think the better. Gabriella, how, how do you help someone understand that it's that loss of a job and that loss of what they expected, that that is in fact a loss and that it's okay to feel 
what they feel. Acknowledging that it's okay to not be okay. And that is something that we strongly push as a message as an organization to peers, to family members, um, that many people are not feeling okay. And it's okay to voice that and understand that and realize that those significant milestones that now are no longer occurring or that job that you worked so hard to get is no longer available. That that is a part of your identity. That is a part of your foundation that is now gone. And not only just acknowledging that it's okay to not feel this way, but also understanding that they're not alone. What advice can we give the person who is trying to help a loved one deal with this secondary loss? Don't wait for that person to reach out to you. If you have an inkling in your in your gut that somebody is struggling, please take that time, reach out to them, ask them how they're feeling, utilizing open-ended questions, um, not the, oh, you're fine, right? Open up with, how are you feeling? I know you've experienced a loss. Tell me about it. I think those are some of the most powerful statements that we can say as friends, trying to help other friends cope with a, with a very personal loss. I would say it's good to be honest. Say, you know, I don't know what to say, but I'm here with you. And I, we can work together in this time. We can support each other. And sometimes showing up with some concrete, um, very practical help, um, perhaps a meal, perhaps a Zoom call, um, reaching out and, and helping people know that they're not alone and they're accepted right where they are. Um, many times we jump to the conclusion that we think we know how we can help that individual. And at times, technically, they don't want to hear an advice. They just want to be listened, as my colleagues has shared, or perhaps they just want to have some company they don't need someone to kind of be in all the time talking, or perhaps, hey, I'm um, just, if you can please go to the groceries and buy something for me, I would really appreciate it. So it's very important just to ask, how can I help you? Thank you so much for joining us. Each of you bring so much to this conversation. Um, I almost feel like, you know, you all are extending a big hug to our viewers who are watching this. And I hope that they feel the compassion and the authentic love and care that you all have for them, because I know that I do. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. The stages of grief are often a forever journey. We can only take one step at a time though. How do we make sure those steps are moving forward towards healing? We won't be perfect at it, but we can help each other get through this. In a beautiful illustration, friends and colleagues, Wendy and Isabel, sat down in our studio to have a candid conversation about the death of Wendy's mother. It was the first time that Wendy had the opportunity to truly begin to grieve that loss. Afterwards, we'll be taking a special moment to sit down one-on-one -on -one with a master level health educator to talk about what hope means nowadays and where this journey can begin again for all of us. Hi. Hey. <laughs> so what led your mother having to go to, what led to her having to go into the rehab? Um, my mom had kidney cancer. The nurse talked to me, we called my brother, we discussed it and decided that, you know, it's probably to that point now and right. that she'd need constant care. And I thought she was gonna pass away in hospice when she was in the hospice house. I was kind of relieved that she went there, that would be a safe place That's for her. That's what we really would want it. So, but then- That was great three days. I know. That was the last day I saw her. Yeah. I get to be with her. Yeah. It was when the day she left I there. Know and went to the nursing home. So she didn't qualify for hospice anymore, so then they had to put her <clears throat> into the rehab. Correct, yeah. And so you, she went in and you couldn't go in with her, could you? No, I went, um, the day they were gonna move her from the hospice house to the nursing home, I went and stayed with her that day until they you know, took her. And um, that was horrible. Yeah, I remember that. What do you think would have been different if you had been able to go inside? Mm. Well, for one, um, 
I know that she would have had pictures up. <laughs> yeah, of her family. Yeah. Of you guys. Yeah. 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 And so I would send pictures right. or I would go see her at the window or whatever mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd take the pictures and I'd put them up to the window. And mm -hmm. But, and to be clear, you were doing what? Probably thousands of people, oh, other people, people had to do, walk across the lawn from the parking lot and stand mm -hmm. outside her window. and. I know some of the pictures you can see her trying to see you and mm -hmm. you can see the screen and you know I think when you're outside your visits aren't as long you know because you're sitting out there in the heat outside the window in and the lawn in the lawn standing yeah standing yeah yep I couldn't even take a chair because then I'm too low and she can't see me so I had to stand out there you couldn't open the window either could nope. you nope no yeah. you can't because then you'd have yeah your breath or whatever so so what I'd have to do is I'd have to call her they would have to pick the phone up for her. For the most part, she could hold the phone, but a lot of times she, you know, it would just kind of, the phone would just kind of I remember that. When glide you told down. me that, it made me so sad when you told me that the phone was just sliding down on her chest. And yeah, because she's not really yeah. cognizant of what it, what it was. And nobody can, you know, they don't have the time to stand there and mm -hmm. hold the phone for her. I know. What kind of goodbye were you allowed? You kind of mentioned it, but... Well, I was able to go um, after the nurse called and said that my mom had passed. She said that, um, I said, well, I want to come up there. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, let me call you back. Mm -hmm. Give me about five minutes. I got to call and make sure that it's yeah. okay. And um, so then I hung up with her, called and let my brother know. And, um, and then she called me back and said that they would allow me to come in. Right. And so um, it was 1030 at night at this point. And so I went up there, me and my husband went up there. And, um, you know, there was a person waiting for us at the front. They were expecting us and they, you know, took our temperature and we did the whole COVID check. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. But we got to uh, spend some time with her. Oh, God. Yeah. So, I always told her she wouldn't die alone. So, yeah. the one promise yeah. <laughs> you don't want to break. So. You're a good daughter though. <laughs> you did every single thing you could do everything that the system would allow and plus, yeah. you know, yep. but you did. I know that. You did everything you could. Yeah. Plus. Yeah. What do you think is the hardest part about losing a person during COVID? Uh, exactly what you just said. Yeah. There's no funeral. Well, I mean, you can have funerals, but mm -hmm. like in our case, yeah. nobody is able to travel here. Right. You know, my sibling is, uh, in Texas and, and for him right. and his wife to travel, they'd be submitting, you know, themselves to hotel rooms yeah. and, you know, anything. So they're not ready to travel. And so right. um, there's no funeral. There's no, it's not like, you know, you have three days off to spend with your family right. to talk about them. And, you know, instead it's gone to, okay, how do we settle her affairs and, you know, all of that and, and to do it alone. and. It's like, you know, you don't take a week off of work. I mean, I think I had a day and a half off of work. You right. Know, so you go back to work and, you know, everybody was very, very sweet about it. Right. And, you know, if you need time or whatever. And, mm -hmm. you know, I got several cards and notes mm -hmm. and everything, which are great. But it's... Um, it's because it's missing that closing piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we all are so used to. Yep. I know I miss that for you. Yep. And he promises your friend, we're gonna figure something out. We'll make it happen. If I know, I know it'll so. happen. I know that we're going to have closure. And believe me, I know my mom is yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. What I can, know my mom's better now. What can I do to help you, Wendy? Oh gosh. Um, um, right now, I mean, it's just, what you do just yeah. be there for me if i need to call <laughs> yeah i feel like your grief is is here mm -hmm. it's just here and so different how to you know you can't fix it you can't and there's there's the grief of losing your mom and then the grief of how 
cumbersome and awkward that whole ending process and unsatisfying it was, mm -hmm. you know, disappointing a lot of things that it was. We are at the Hartwood Preserve Conservation Cemetery in Newport Ritchie, a place of solace and comfort for families. I love the fact that we're doing the interview here because you've spent decades of your life um, teaching folks how to pivot from yes. grief to hope. Yes. And so my first question to you is how, is it possible to get through that stage in grief to the point where you can be hopeful again? I believe it is because when we look at the stages of grief and we know that acceptance is the last stage, mm -hmm. I, I know through working with many people that, you know, getting through those stages, it's not always how we see it, meaning people sometimes think that when I go through this stage, it's just going to be here, then I'm going to move on, then I'm going to move on. But that's not how it works. And I believe when we talk about acceptance, mm -hmm. it's the ability not only to accept what's happening, but how do I accept myself? and being able to really understand the processes that I've gone through dealing with this grief cycle. And acceptance looks different for everybody and it has a different meaning for everybody. So to me, when you talk about that acceptance part, yes, it's there. It's just possible. Yes, exactly. What does it look like for me? So when I talk about acceptance, it is possible. How, how can faith mm -hmm. or spirituality, not everyone ascribes to a right. certain religious group, right? But how can faith or spirituality help you reach that point of acceptance and being hopeful yeah. again? You know, it's one of those things when we talk about that because, you know, everybody, I don't, I guess I think of it in this way. We all have this understanding of what a higher power is for us and we can name it for whatever it wants to be. But how do I use it at that time mm -hmm. to help balance me through those times that's the most difficult in my life? What does my faith teach me? Of, of course, when we look at faith as a whole, mm -hmm. we begin to understand the process of God. But like you said, there are some people who don't believe. But I do understand this part, though they might not believe in what we consider a God, they believe in something that can help them process through this time of hurt and pain that they're living in. Something greater than themselves. Yes, exactly. What should we be hoping for? You know, in this process, we gotta begin to hope for peace within ourselves not only the external part, but how am I dealing with me? You know, and when I say the hope, it's my hope in knowing that no matter what's going on, I have resilient behavior. All resiliency is the ability to bounce back after something traumatic has knocked the wind out of me. And in that ability to bounce back, either I'm gonna bounce or I'm gonna break. I'm not gonna break, I'm gonna bounce. This is a season that we're all living through, just like in, in the natural seasons come and go. This season of everything that's happening, it's not permanent. And we gotta learn how to process through it in the right way. And peace, compassion, love, and gratitude are the things that we should be hoping for and living in during this time. There's a lot of things that are going on that we could get bogged down with. But when I focus on those things, compassion, love, joy, peace, when I start looking at gratitude, how gracious am I? You know, and how am I taking care of myself? What are my words of affirmation that I speak to myself? That's one of the things when people are going through grief that we work with helping them to understand what are the things that I'm saying to myself that encourages me, to help me through the process. And I believe right now, those are the key. Compassion, I believe is a big one at the list because when we're compassionate with ourselves and we're compassionate with people, it leaves that, that mark and that imprint on them to say someone cared just enough to show me compassion and love today. Mm -hmm. Even when I didn't feel it for myself. And I think those things are, I mean, those are very rich and they carry us through this time. I do feel that God sends you messengers and yes. sends you gifts. Yes, he does. Because this program, mm -hmm. this project, Speaking Grief, mm -hmm. has been a blessing in my life. Yes. I lost my dad six years ago and being able to talk to the panelists, being yes. able to hear the stories of people in our community that have lost yes. loved ones, that have others have lost mm -hmm. things in their life that they expected, so instrumental to who they were as people. Mm -hmm. And now coming here in this beautiful place yes, beautiful. and talking to you about comfort and healing and reaching a place where you feel hope again. Yes. 
I feel that this is God's gift to me so that I could finally, mm. you know, feel that my dad is is okay. Yes. And that losing my dad was just the beginning of a new chapter in yes. my life. That's right. I went through the same thing, losing my father and knowing that feeling that you have to get through to help you see another day. It's not easy, but guess what? We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. And that's the positive affirmation we speak to ourselves that I can do it. I'm still in the land of the living. And that's the part for us to grab a hold to. Thank yes. you for sharing your You're light welcome. with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. There's a certain odd comfort knowing that every human has had their world turned upside down. Not one of us is alone in this. Not one of us has an easy answer. Even still, history is full of humans doing the impossible, of facing struggles and waiting for the hope of dawn. Whatever you're feeling, that's okay. If you don't yet know how to process, that's okay. If you're finding your way through, that's okay. If you're missing human connection, if you're coming out of the worst part of your life, if you're starting over, if you don't know what tomorrow will bring, if you're just now letting yourself grieve for the first time, that's okay. See the loss, hear the stories, sit in the discomfort, fight the urge to lessen the tension. May you find healing, strength, and peace. You are not alone. To our community, thank you for sharing your stories. To our experts, thank you for your invaluable insight. We might still have a hard, long journey ahead, but we can be a source of comfort for each other, easing long-term damage and striving toward hope. To watch this program again and to access resources for care and coping, please visit our website and be on the lookout for more Public Square episodes where we focus on the stories and expertise of our community to thoughtfully discuss crucial issues facing us today. The sun shines through and warms my skin. Time stands still, but the world keeps burning. Support for this program was generously provided by New York Life Foundation, the National Cremation Society, BayCare Behavior Health Services, Empath Health, the Tidewell Foundation, Heartwood Preserve, and the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay.